Hello YouTube! In this video we're going to look at the classical pragmatist theory of truth. Now I should say right off the bat this is a bit more tricky to characterize than the correspondence theory and the coherence theory. Part of this is because the pragmatists often disagreed amongst themselves about some of their fundamental commitments, um, and part of it is that there are a lot of common misunderstandings of pragmatism. Um, I mean, most notably, uh, it's sometimes claimed that pragmatism is just the view that truth is a matter of utility. Uh, P is true just in case P is useful. Um, I mean, we'll see that there might be something to that, but it's not really a fair characterization. So, the basic idea of pragmatism in general is captured in what's known as the pragmatic maxim. Uh, in general, when inquiring about the meaning of any concept, we should start by considering the practical consequences of the concept. Concepts can't be properly understood merely by giving a dictionary definition. A mere definition can't make our ideas clear because we may not know what to make of the definition itself. So, um, if, if we want to understand a concept, we have to ask questions like, what is the point of the concept? What role does it play in our practical activities? What difference does it make whether or not the concept is correctly applied? So, when we're thinking about the question of what is truth, then we need to ask, okay, what role does the concept of truth play in our inquiries? What difference does it make whether or not a belief is true? Um, so this is the way that a, a pragmatist is going to approach this, uh, this problem of <clears throat> characterizing truth. So the two most influential figures in early pragmatism were uh, Charles Peirce and William James, um, and we'll examine their approaches to truth in turn. So let's start with Charles Peirce. Uh, <clears throat> okay then. So, to understand the concept, we begin with this question of, well, what are, the, what are the practical consequences of the concept? So, in what contexts do we usually talk about truth? Well, when we inquire, when we make assertions, when we hold beliefs, when we deliberate about things, we usually take it that we're aiming at the truth, right? We want, we want to make true assertions, we want to hold true beliefs. When, when we deliberate, we want to get at the truth. Right? So, so truth is the, the goal of inquiry. We want to form true beliefs and we want to find methods of belief formation that reliably deliver true beliefs. So we need to think about how it is that inquiry works. Now as Peirce sees it, inquiry begins with doubt. I find myself with various beliefs about the world, many of which I've simply been inculcated with since I was a child, and then something prompts me to question one of my beliefs. Maybe the belief doesn't conform to my experiences, or maybe I discover that the source of the belief was untrustworthy. For instance, let's say I'm told that Santa Claus delivers presents every year by coming down the chimney, and I just believe it, right? This is just something my parents have said to me, I just accept it. So this is just one of these beliefs I find myself with. But, but then, you know, one day I sort of think to myself, wait a minute, Santa Claus is quite a large man and the chimney is quite small. Wouldn't Santa Claus be too big to fit down a chimney? So I notice this, this belief that Santa Claus comes down the chimney every year, it doesn't fit, it doesn't, it doesn't work with my assumptions about how, how objects in general, like people, work, right? Like, okay, Santa Claus is too big to fit into that space. So, okay. I mean, whatever the reason, the, the point is, is that I'm now in a state of doubt, right? So I, I had this belief that Santa Claus came down the chimney every year. Then I noticed it doesn't fit with my other beliefs. So now I'm not really sure what to think. I'm in a state of doubt. I don't know what I, I, I sort of think. Well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to think. And, and doubt is an uncomfortable state, um, according to Peirce anyway. Da doubt is uncomfortable. We, we want to resolve doubt. And the, the goal of inquiry is relief from doubt. So once I'm in this state of doubt about whether or not, San, uh, whether or not Santa Claus comes down the chimney, I'm going to try to figure out what's actually going on. I'm going to, I'm going to start 
investigating. I'm going to start inquiring. And, and the goal of inquiry is to find a, a, a new belief that is resistant to doubt. It's to remove doubt. Um, so, <clears throat> goal of inquiry is relief from doubt. Relief from doubt is achieved once I find a belief that is resistant to doubt. Now, inquiry is undertaken not just by individuals, but by whole communities. Uh, indeed, one important source of doubt is peer disagreement. So when I find that people who are just as intelligent and well-informed as me disagree with me about some of my beliefs, that's going to prompt me to doubt those beliefs. Um, but you know, any, anyway, so like whole communities, whole groups of people will, will engage in inquiries. Now, an interesting feature of at least some fields of inquiry is that they achieve a convergence of belief. Different people with different biases, using different experimental methods, reasoning with different evidence, will over time come to the same conclusion. And then other people can take that conclusion for granted in their own inquiries and they can build on it in various ways. Peirce gives the example of the attempts to establish the speed of light. One scientist might proceed by studying the transits of Venus and the aberrations of the stars. Another might look at the oppositions of Mars and the eclipses of Jupiter's satellites. Uh, initially, they might obtain slightly different results, but as these methods are perfected, we find that they point in the same direction. So we gradually converge on a single precise figure. Today, of course, the speed of light can be established by many experimental methods and scientists are just going to take it for granted when constructing new theories. We don't really even need to investigate that anymore. Um, we just we just kind of know what the speed of light is. That's just an, something that is now uh, a, an assumption of our general theories of the world. Um, so, well, I mean, when I say assumption, obviously it's still supported by the evidence, right? But, but we don't really need to investigate that evidence anymore. Um, when we ask, what is the speed of light? We just have a straightforward answer at this point that basically everybody agrees on. Um, or consider the many lines of evidence establishing evolution by natural selection. You can look at the fossil record. You can look at the distribution of species and unique characteristics in particular environments, like the characteristics of island species. You can look at homologous anatomical structures, evidence from molecular biology. Uh, with natural selection established, we can, you know, we can then build on it. We can, you know, like the combination of natural selection and Mendelian genetics in the modern evolutionary synthesis. So we converge, we see this convergence on more and more and more beliefs, building up um, a theory of the world that is accepted uh, by everybody. Um, so there are some methods that are especially effective for settling doubt. Uh, for, for Peirce, the scientific method is exemplary here. The hope is that by applying the scientific method, we will gradually converge on a stable set of beliefs about the world that are resistant to any genuine doubts. So as Peirce puts it, let any human being have enough information and exert enough thought upon any question and the result will be that he will arrive at a certain definite conclusion, which is the same that any other mind will reach. Um, I mean, presumably, well, we might say that's not going to be true for, any, for just any question, but there do seem to be some fields that exhibit that kind of convergence. Okay, now with all of that said, we can understand what it is for a belief to be true. The aim of inquiry is to free us from doubt. We can say that a true belief is a belief that is permanently settled, that is no longer open to doubt. Once we have achieved convergence on a particular belief and it no longer faces any genuine criticism, it no longer faces any criticism that, that gives us serious doubts, that belief will be considered true. Uh, so Peirce summarises his position. The opinion which is fated to be ultimately agreed to by all who investigate is what we mean by truth. And this is the practical role that the concept of truth actually plays for us, right? Like, like we that th this is the context in which we will actually judge things to be true. Um, so, I mean, another way to put this would be to say something like uh, P is true. That what that means is that P would be accepted by all who investigate it under ideal circumstances. 
uh, under ideal circumstances is doing a lot of work here, of course, because in practice, there is no proposition that commands universal agreement, and perhaps there never will be. I mean, at the very least, people need to live long enough to investigate it thoroughly. If the apocalypse occurs in the next century, there's going to be plenty of inquiries left unfinished. So we have to imagine that, you know, that there's enough time, for one thing, um, uh, and, and that people are sort of able to engage in investigations. Um, I mean, you know, again, like human beings might just become, the, maybe the, the water gets poisoned and we just lose our cognitive capacities or something. But putting those aside, if we assume ideal conditions and we assume just an infinite amount of time, um, then the idea is, is that a proposition is true if it would be investigated by all who investigate it, if it would be accepted by all who investigate it under those conditions. Um, another pass at this sort of view of truth would be to say P is true, uh, just in case P will be accepted at the end of inquiry, were inquiry to continue as long as possible. Now, it's it's worth keeping in mind again, it's not exactly clear that this is intended as a definition of truth. As we noted earlier, pragmatists don't see much value in giving definitions. We're trying to elucidate the point of the concept or the actual role that the concept plays. So Peirce gives a specific example. He, uh, he says, the truth of the proposition that Caesar crossed the Rubicon consists in the fact that the further we push our archaeological and other studies, the more strongly that conclusion will force itself onto our minds forever, or would do so were study to go on forever. So, I mean, look, if we want to know whether Caesar crossed the Rubicon, how do we proceed? I mean, at the end of the day, there's nothing more we can do beyond uncovering the archaeological evidence, examining historical records, and so on. We accept a statement as true when we think that the statement has been appropriately justified. Um, I mean, that's just how we proceed in practice, right? I'm going to if you want to persuade me that something is true, you just give me the evidence for it. And if I think you've given me enough evidence, then I'm going to accept that it's true. Um, and then if we ask, well, is is that really true? Is that proposition really true? That's just going to amount to asking whether it will continue to be viewed as justified. If If the proposition continues to fit with the evidence, no matter how much we investigate it, if it continues to be resistant to doubt, then it's true. Um, you know, fit, fitting with the evidence, that settles our doubts, and as long as doubts remain settled indefinitely, what more could we ask for? Well, I mean, there's nothing more. There's nothing more we could ask for. That's as, that's as good as it gets. Um, so that's, that's what truth is. So ultimately, on Peirce's view, truth is a matter of stable consensus, permanently settled consensus. Now, in at least some places, Peirce suggests that it doesn't actually make any difference in principle how this consensus is achieved. So Peirce says, and I quote, if a general belief which is stable and immovable can in any way be produced, though it be by the faggot and the rack, um, the... Uh, the faggot here refers to, I believe, iron bars as in a prison. Um, so, uh, though it be by that, to talk of any error in such a belief is absurd. <clears throat> so, um, in practice, Peirce expects that the, on the only open scientific inquiry is going to be suitable for achieving a stable consensus. The problem with using the rack, uh, the torture device, is that in the long run, um, it just doesn't work. It doesn't achieve consensus. Take, for instance, Lysenkoism in the Soviet Union. The Soviet government suppressed natural selection and Mendelian genetics, and it achieved a temporary consensus on Lysenko's theory. But it didn't last. I mean, partly because human beings strive for freedom. Um, you know, if you, if you try to use the rack, they're going to resist. Uh, we just sort of naturally want to do our own things. Um, but maybe more importantly, Lysenkoism faced the tribunal of experience. I mean, it, uh, it promised an increase in crop yields, and it failed to achieve that. While the modern evolutionary synthesis that was accepted elsewhere, that 
resulted in enormous progress. Um, so this is the reason why any consensus that's produced by force is eventually going to be assailed by serious doubt. Um, it, it, you know, like you can you can force people to accept Lysenkoism, but you can't sort of force people to have perceptions. Like you can't you can't just control that by force. Um, I mean, maybe to some extent you can, but but not completely. So eventually, you know, any sort of theory that's imposed by force is going to run up against contradicting perceptions. The scientific method achieves stable consensus because it's based on testing theories against public observations. Our perception is not something that we can control, um, or at least we don't have total control over it. Whatever environment I find myself in, I just will be subject to various sensory experiences, whether or not I desire them. So if I open my eyes right now, I'm... I, I just see things around me, like I just see a computer in front of me, and that's not up to me. The computer is, is there regardless of whether or not I want it there. Um, and other people will have the same, or at least relevantly similar, experiences to me were they to be sitting in my room with their eyes open. The, I mean, basically, the computer affects you in much the same way it affects me. So by using public observations, observations that are not under anybody's control as a means of testing different theories, science can ensure a sort of universal evidence base that will lead us to the same conclusions in the long run. It will lead us to theories that are resistant to doubt. I mean, we might think of the truth here as, as a kind of magnet for beliefs. Human minds are pulled towards the truth, but crucially this convergence of opinion is just what truth consists in. So it's important to keep in mind that Peirce does not take scientific methods and open inquiry and all of that to be criterial of the truth. Um, when the consensus is achieved by scientific inquiry, what makes this consensus true is not that it was arrived at by the scientific method. Rather, what makes it true is simply that it is the stable, permanently settled consensus. Uh, had things been different, had some other method been just as effective at producing consensus, then presumably that would have been a perfectly fine method for getting at the truth. It's maybe worth comparing this uh, with, the <clears throat> with the correspondence theory. Um, so the correspondence theorist gives us a kind of definition, gives us a definition. Right, the correspondence theorist says that P is true just in case P matches reality. Now, Peirce says that this is actually perfectly acceptable as a definition, right? If, if, you, if you want a definition of truth, you can't really do much better than saying that, uh, well, P is true just in case P matches reality. The problem is that it's just trivial. It doesn't tell us anything about how the concept of truth works because, I mean, if you just say, well, P is true just in case P matches reality, the problem is we don't, this doesn't give us any grasp on what reality is. It doesn't give us any grasp on what it is for one proposition to match another uh, or to match something else. So what does matching reality actually mean? Uh, we don't know. Um, so correspondence theory tells us nothing about why truth matters or what leads us to identify particular beliefs as true or how best to go about discovering the truth. It doesn't really tell us anything substantive about truth. Um, so Peirce is willing to accept this idea that P is true just in case P matches reality, but then we need to ask, what is reality? Well, um, so actually Peirce continues the, uh, the quote that I gave earlier. The opinion which is fated to be ultimately agreed to by all who investigate is what we mean by truth, and the object represented in this opinion is the real. Um, he also says, the existence of external realities depends upon the fact that opinion will finally settle in the belief in them. Okay, so reality, like truth, is determined by permanent community consensus. This is why Peirce can accept the correspondence theorist's basic claim that truth is that which matches reality. So the pragmatist can, you know, they, they, they can agree with this intuitive link between truth and reality, right? Tr truth is uh, just a matter of reporting what's real. Truth is a matter of reporting the way things are. Um, but 
Peirce denies that reality is wholly mind independent in the way that most traditional correspondence theorists have assumed. Uh, to treat truth as correspondence to a mind independent reality, to a reality external to us, well, I mean, that would land us in scepticism. We have no access to such reality. Uh, if there is, you know, any mind independent reality is, that's only going to come to us via our perceptions organized by some particular conceptual scheme. We can't step outside of our minds and check that our beliefs match the external world. That's the classic concern with traditional correspondence theory. Um, but then, I mean, moreover, and perhaps more importantly from from Pierce's, from Peirce's point of view, this idea of, you know, like a mind independent reality, um, that just doesn't, that doesn't play any role in any of our practices. Um, again, it's, it's just sort of inert. Um, so Peirce will agree that, yes, the, um, the truth is that which matches reality, but then that's going to just follow from the fact that both truth and reality are fixed by community consensus. It is worth noting, though, that um, this is still going to allow for a notion of objectivity. Uh, Peirce is explicit that reality has to be understood in terms of what is accepted in the long run. So he says that real reality is independent, not necessarily of thought in general, but only of what you or I or any finite number of men may think about it. The truth and the reality, you know, truth and reality are independent of my particular opinion, they're independent of any particular mind, or indeed the minds of any specific sets of people. Um, so I can, you know, like my beliefs can be objectively wrong, right? My beliefs might be overturned in the long run. And, that, and that's the case for any, you know, specific set of people. Okay, well, uh, that was Purse. Now, just a quick advert. Um, if you like my channel, I have a Patreon on which I upload. I upload bonus videos about once a week. Um, I have a PayPal if you want to give a one-off donation. And uh, I offer private tutoring in philosophy, so um, send an email if you're interested in that. I also have a Discord, and the link to all of this stuff will be in the description. Okay then, uh, let's turn to William James, uh, William James's views on truth. Now, James is tricky um, because he sometimes seems to endorse different theories of truth, uh, sometimes within the same page. Um, still, we can extract some general themes from his work. James actually gives the closest statement of the slogan that is mm, sometimes somewhat misleadingly attributed to pragmatism, namely the idea that truth is merely a matter of utility. Um, so James says that truth is, and I quote, uh, only the expedient in the way of our thinking. Okay, so let's see what exactly he means by this. Well, first of all, like Peirce, James endorses correspondence theory in a sense. Uh, as far as James is concerned, it is perfectly acceptable to say that truth is a matter of agreement with reality. But that leaves us with the question, what is reality and what is it to agree with reality? Well, as far as James uses the term, reality is a matter of experience broadly construed. So reality, James says, means nothing more than the other conceptual or perceptual experiences with which a given present experience may find itself in point of fact, in point of fact mixed up. So reality here is, is, is experience, just all experience, broadly speaking. Um, a series of experiences to which all people are subject. Okay, the next question then is, what does it mean for a belief to be in agreement with this experiential reality? Like, what is the relevant relation between belief and reality? Well, it is a matter of fulfilling various practi practical and theoretical goals. So James says that the truth is, uh, and I quote, any idea that helps us to deal either practically or intellectually with either the reality or its belongings that does not entangle our progress in frustrations that fits in fact and, and adapts our life to the reality's whole setting. Uh, elsewhere he writes that any idea that will carry us prosperously from any one part of our experience to any other part 
linking things satisfactorily, working securely, saving labour is true for just so much, true in so far forth, true instrumentally. So, a belief is in agreement with our experiential reality just when the belief allows us to achieve our goals and it forms part of a smooth web of other beliefs. Uh, now, notice that for James, consensus isn't really relevant. It's not particularly important whether or not we achieve consensus. Uh, the truth is the expedient in our way of thinking, but there's no guarantee that all people in the long run will come to accept what is expedient in our way of thinking. So, broadly speaking, Peirce gives a, a consensus view of truth, right? Truth is a matter of permanently settled consensus. James gives a, a, a kind of instrumental view of truth. Truth is what fits our experience, regardless of whether or not people acknowledge that or, you know, come to agree on that. Um, I mean, we, we, we may just forever be mistaken. We may, we may be wrong about what is uh, actually expedient in our way of thinking. We may be, we, we may hold various beliefs that are not expedient in our way of thinking, and that might just be the case forever, regardless of how much uh, inquiry, uh, you know, regardless of how much effort we put into inquiry, we might just always go wrong on that and never find the truth. So in that sense, you know, uh, James perhaps, you know, may, maybe uh, allows for a kind of, you know, objectivity that Peirce doesn't, or at least that's you know, one way of, of interpreting James here. Um, now, James does not offer any precise characterization of what is involved in fulfilling goals, um, but there are some general criteria we can point to. So suppose, to use an example from James, I say, the desk exists. How do I go about establishing the truth of this? Well, first, I can perform various actions with the desk. I can shake it, or I can place objects on it. I can use and manipulate the desk in various ways. So the belief the desk exists helps me to manipulate objects. I can you know, achieve various practical goals that way. Second, I can create a representation of the desk that other people will agree with. I can describe what I see or draw a picture of what I see that conforms to what you see. And when you hear my description or see my picture, you'll, you know, you'll nod your head. You'll say, yep, that's, that's what I see in front of me too. So the belief the desk exists plays a role in communication. Um, so the true beliefs then are those that allow for uh, successful prediction, explanation, uh, manipulation of objects, communication with other people, these are the marks of truth. Uh, now, it's important to note that on James's view, um, and I assume Peirce would probably agree with this, uh, we value prediction and explanation not merely because they help us to achieve practical goals, but also because, well, these sorts of intellectual activities have become goals in themselves. Human beings aim not just to do various things, we also want to satisfy intellectual curiosity. Uh, obviously, not all theories are going to have practical applications in the colloquial sense. Studying active galactic nuclei might not help to build new technologies or to cure illnesses, but it does help to satisfy our intellectual curiosity. It helps us to satisfy our desire for a simple, elegant picture of how the world works and you know, a theory about active galactic nuclei uh, may well offer that. It, it, it may, may give us that picture and it may fit smoothly with our other beliefs. And so we might then say that it is true. Um, so what we can see from all of this is that, you know, in, in some sense, uh, truth is just utility. Um, so this kind of, this, this sort of slogan that's sometimes attributed to pragmatism, right? P is true just in case P is useful. Yeah, um, in a sense, yes. But we, we're we using usefulness in a, in a very specific way here. It's a very strict kind of utility that's meant here. Not just any sort of usefulness will do. Um, for one thing, as, as we saw, James says that the truth does not entangle our progress in frustrations. So take something like Newtonian mechanics. That's a remarkably powerful theory. To this day, we still use Newtonian mechanics to send probes to Pluto. Newtonian mechanics is very well supported by observations. It allows correct predictions in many contexts. It allows us to manipulate things in, in ways that achieve our goals. It's built on a very simple set of laws. Nevertheless, it does 
entangle our progress in frustrations. It runs into very serious problems in specific contexts, such as accounting for the precession of Mercury's perihelion. Newtonian mechanics is useful in many ways, but that's not sufficient for truth. What's, what's, what's required for truth is stability and coherence with the rest of our experiences and beliefs. It, it, it can't just be useful sometimes, it has to be useful all the time. And so this allows us to make sense of the idea of useful false beliefs. Newtonian mechanics is useful, but it's not true because in some contexts it fails to accommodate our experiences. As with Peirce's account, uh, on James's view, we have to judge utility for the whole community and over the long run. Uh, James continues the quote with which I opened this section. He says, the true, to put, it, put, to put it briefly, is only the expedient in our way of thinking. Expedient in almost any fashion and expedient in the long run and on the whole, of course. For what meets expediently all the experience in sight will not necessarily meet all further experiences equally satisfactorily. And this deals with, you know, the more obvious potential counterexamples to the pragmatist approach. Newtonian mechanics did not meet expediently all experiences. Many of its predictions were correct. It were incorrect. If we were to fly probes to Mercury without correcting for relativistic effects, we would run into problems. Or think about things like cognitive illusions, like optimism bias. It might be useful for me to believe that I am less at risk of getting diseases. That might be useful throughout my life because it might improve my mood, you know, if I if I assume that I'm, I'm very unlikely to get cancer or something like that, it would clearly not be useful for a doctor or an epidemiologist to share my optimism bias there. What we have to imagine then is, is something more like an ideal theory. Uh, this theory correctly predicts all phenomena. The evidence in its favour is powerful enough that everybody is convinced of it. Um, it's based on a, a simple set of laws that allow for easy calculations, it allows us to manipulate objects and achieve our goals. Basically, there's no way that anybody can see to improve this theory. The question is, what the hell could it mean to say that this theory is false? I mean, a correspondence theorist will say, well, the theory might nevertheless fail to correspond to the facts. The pragmatist would object that there's just no sense to be made of facts conceived in this kind of way, such facts could not make any difference to anything. Um, you know, this, 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 the, the very idea, like, when, when, we, when we talk about this theory and we say, ah, well, it fails to correspond to the facts, we're not really, we're not really even saying anything. Um, like, okay, if you're say so the pragmatist response would be, well, all right, if it fails to correspond to the facts, where is the failure, right? Go on, point out the failure. But, but by stipulation, this theory is ideal. Nobody can point to any way of improving it. Nobody can point to any problem with it in terms of like whether or not it fits the evidence, whether or not you know it's simple and easy to use and so on. Um, so yeah, this theory just will be true um, on the pragmatist view. Okay then. Let's turn to some objections to pragmatism. Uh, now, as we've seen, there isn't a single pragmatist theory of truth. Uh, Peirce proposes that truth is permanently settled consensus. James proposes that the truth is the expedient in our way of thinking. Um, nevertheless, there are some general challenges that both accounts face. Uh, first of all, there is what Peirce called the buried secrets problem. There are truths that are now inaccessible to us. Surely, there is a fact of the matter about, for instance, the past, uh, or distant parts of the universe. Um, so, there is, or there was, a particular number of blades of grass on Bertrand Russell's lawn on the 26th of June, 1891. That's what we would usually think, but how do we make sense of this on the pragmatist view? It doesn't seem like any answer to this question could ever help us to promote our goals or could fit into a stable consensus theory of the world, um, right? I mean, it's just, I mean, it's kind of irrelevant these days exactly how many blades of grass there were on Bertrand Russell's lawn on the 26th of June, 1891. It's hard to see how any answer to that one way or the other could be, you know, part of our best theory of how the world works. Um, I mean, it looks like we just 
it, we just have no way to establish this one way or the other. Moreover, notice that many of the propositions that are expedient with respect to our current experiences um, will not be so for the whole community in the long run. They will become buried secrets in the future. Uh, so, you know, like what exactly in, you know, what in 100 years will go any way to confirming that I am sitting at a computer at exactly this time. So I can see right now the time um, and I know that I'm you know, sitting at a computer at this specific time. Uh, and it doesn't look like anything in a hundred years is going to, it, it, it is going to confirm that. Um, except of course for the fact that I've just made this video and I have therefore put the evidence out there into the world. But if you're watching this video, uh, you can you can state a similar proposition for yourself where there just won't be any evidence bearing on it, right? Um, in, you know, 100 years. So the general problem here is that pragmatism has difficulty accounting for truths about particular situations, such as what happens in my room at a particular time. The evidence relevant to those situations gets lost very quickly, so there's no way to achieve a, a long-term consensus on them. Um, now, James's response to this sort of problem was to, um, was to shift to, to a more subjectivist, relativist view of truth. I mentioned that James is somewhat difficult to interpret because he seems to endorse different theories of truth at different times. Um, so when I was presenting James earlier, I was emphasize, you know, I, I was presenting the more objectivist side of him. Um, but... Uh, okay, sometimes he, ob he emphasizes objectivity, you know, the idea that the truth is what's expedient for the whole community over the long run. That's kind of analogous to Peirce's view. At other times, James talks as if we can only define truth for specific individuals. So uh, I, it, here's a, a quote. He says, when you say the idea is true, does that mean true for you, the critic, or true for the believer whom you are describing? The critic's trouble over this seems to come from take from his taking the word true irrelatively, whereas the pragmatist always means true for him who experiences the workings. So from this point of view, the answer to the buried secrets problem is simply that truth can vary over time and vary for different people. There was a fact of the matter about how many blades of grass were on Bertrand Russell's lawn. He could have gone out and counted them and established such fact. But now there is no such truth. Uh, so, so that, 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 yeah, I mean, there's just, it's just indeterminate. Um, I, for us, at least. Um, it's currently true that I'm sitting in front of a computer, but for people 100 years in the future, this may not be true. Perhaps if cognitive illusions like optimism bias really do promote well-being, it might be, it might well be true for me that I have a lower risk of getting cancer, but this would be false for a scientist who's studying human life expectancy or whatever. So I think this is probably the closest we can find to the to, to the sort of naive pragmatism, right? To the view that truth is just what's useful to believe. If it's useful for, for me to believe that P, then P is true for me. Um, so, I mean, look, this does, I guess, um, address this problem of buried secrets. Uh, like, when it comes to something like the blades of grass on Bertrand Russell's lawn, this is not a buried secret because there's no secret. There's just no fact of the matter anymore. Um, of course, this kind of approach is going to raise all of the traditional objections to relativism about truth. Um, I have a video on, well, I have a few videos on relativism about truth, but I have a, a video which uh, addresses some of the traditional objections to relativism about truth. So I'll link that in the comments. Um, you know, you can, you can see that video for more on that. All right, so Peirce had a, a different approach to this buried secrets problem. Um, Peirce was not willing to embrace relativism. Again, um, we have to consider the role that truth plays in inquiry. Um, Peirce holds that it is a kind of a methodological assumption of any inquiry that when we engage in inquiry, there will be a fact of the matter one way or the other about what we are investigating. We can hope that inquiry will settle on an answer to any question that we investigate for long enough. After all, there have been plenty of happy surprises in the past. Um, August Comte famously predicted that we would never know the compositions of the stars. He thought that that was just something that would be 
forever inaccessible to us. He was proven wrong less than a century later with the development of spectroscopy. You know, we found... So it seemed like this question of the composition of the stars was an inaccessible secret. But then technology develops in a surprising way which allowed us to to open a window on the composition of the stars. It allowed us to uncover this particular secret. In the same way, maybe we will find a way to recover these buried secrets of the past. So, you know, I mean, I said there's there's no fact about the number of blades of grass. You know, it's like there's no way for us to establish the number of blades of grass on Bertrand Russell's lawn in 1891. Well, who knows? Maybe one day we will have a way to establish that. Um, okay, so this is this is what Person says anyway. Uh, a couple of problems with this. First of all, it's not clear why inquiry in general would need this as a methodological assumption. Suppose, for instance, that we are inquiring into future contingents, statements like there will be a sea battle tomorrow. Um, so these are statements about the future where we think, you know, <clears throat> they might happen, they might not happen. Now, there are some philosophers who argue that if the universe is indeterministic, then there's no fact to the matter whether such statements are true. They are neither true nor false. Um, it seems implausible to suppose that the participants in this debate are taking it as a methodological assumption that for any proposition P, P is either true or false. Um, I mean, that would just beg the question against the indeterminacy view. Uh, so, 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 I mean, it just doesn't seem to be true that inquiry has to proceed with this assumption or with this hope that, that we will always be able to establish um, an answer one way or the other. Uh, I, I mean, more generally, like why, yeah, why shouldn't we discover that there are some propositions that are just neither true nor false? Um, it seems like that's a, at least an open possibility, like epistemic, it's, a, it's an epistemic possibility, right? Like, yeah, we, we, maybe the principle of bivalence fails in some cases, and uh, there are some propositions that are just neither true nor false. Um, but second, even if uh, we do agree with Peirce <clears throat> that, um, you know, it's kind of, it's like a methodological assumption of inquiry or, you know, it's at least a hope of inquiry that we will establish an answer one way or the other. It's somewhat unclear how this even addresses the buried secrets problem. The buried secrets problem arises from the fact that the pragmatist seems committed to denying that there's any truth one way or the other about how many blades of grass were on Bertrand Russell's lawn, for instance. Now, Peirce's response is that, OK, well, we proceed in inquiry with the hope that we will figure out a way to reach consensus on this. Now, we may, in the context of a specific inquiry, have that hope. So if, for some reason, we were to investigate the question of Bertrand Russell's lawn, maybe we would proceed with the hope that we would be able to establish, that, that we would be able to come up with some way of establishing exactly how many blades of grass there were on it. But that doesn't really say anything about, well, how, on a pragmatist view, can there be any truth for cases where such a consensus doesn't arise? So, like, maybe in specific contexts. So, so sure, I mean, if I engage in an inquiry, maybe I'm just sort of presupposing that I will be able to come up with a way of establishing an answer one way or the other. But obviously, there are lots of things that I'm not going to inquire about. There are lots of things that I'm just not interested in inquiring about. The question of how many blades of grass there were on Bertrand Russell's lawn is is one of them, right? Like, nobody really even has any interest in that. So we don't, we don't need to have the hope that there's going to be a way to establish how many blades of grass there are. Um, we, we don't even need to hope that uh, in the case of Bertrand Russell's lawn, because it just doesn't matter to us. So maybe the, the you know, the way we should state this is that uh, we have to hope that there's an answer one way or the other to questions that matter to us. But for questions that don't matter to us, it just doesn't matter. Right? Like, it, you know, we don't need to hope that there's going to be a way of establishing an answer one way or the other. Um, so we, it seems like there could still be buried secrets with respect to those questions, even on the pragmatist view and even if you accept everything Peirce has said here. OK, another problem is the problem of what we might call unreasonable optimism. 
So why suppose that there will be a theory that achieves permanent consensus? Or that there will be a theory that is expedient for all experiences in the long run? I mean, we might think there's actually some reason to doubt that there will be a theory that fulfills either of these requirements. Uh, for one thing, it seems plausible that people will weigh the consequences of a theory very differently. This is the case even if we're just talking about assessing evidence. Purser's hope, as we saw, is that perception should provide this universal ground for testing scientific theories. So, you know, we converge to a consensus because everybody has the same or at least relevantly similar perceptual experiences. But often, <clears throat> even our judgment of what we are, are observing is going to depend on prior values. Um, so I, I have a much more detailed discussion of this in my video on values in science, which I will link in the uh, comments. But for example, if we're investigating whether a particular chemical is a carcinogen, we may be more inclined to classify a sample of organic material as showing a tumour if we more strongly prioritise public health and safety. So, you know, you can you can imagine like an investigation into whether a chemical is a carcinogen and then you expose organic material to this chemical. And then you have to classify, um, you know, like, does this sample of organic material show a tumour? And in some cases, it's going to be very clear that you have a tumour. In some cases, it's going to be clear that there's no tumour. But there's probably going to be vague cases where it's not entirely clear whether or not the sample shows a tumour. And how you classify that sample is probably going to depend on whether you prioritise public health and safety or whether you prioritise technological development and economic productivity. And, you know, if you prioritise public health and safety, you'll be more inclined to, you know, be on the safe side and sort of say, oh, no, that's probably a tumour. Prioritise economic productivity, you, again, might, might be less inclined to do that. Um, as I said, go and check out the video on values in science for a, a discussion of this sort of case. Um, beyond this, people will weigh theoretical virtues differently. Some people care more about simplicity of theoretical laws. Others care more about uh, empirical adequacy. And so we might think that different values like this are likely to lead to intractable disagreements. Um, I mean... Even putting this all of this aside, though, the, the basic point here is we don't know what the long run of human history will look like. The pragmatist has to commit to this idea that, um, you know, like, OK, if if we allowed inquiry to just go on forever, then it would, you know, it would produce a consensus on a theory or, you know, there would be some theory that would be expedient for all experiences. So the pragmatist is making a prediction about the future of human history, or at least what human history would look like if it were allowed to continue. And that prediction might seem unreasonably optimistic. Um, you know, we're sort of projecting the, I, I, I mean, I guess in many ways, you know, we're projecting sort of just a, the last few hundred years of scientific development indefinitely into the future. Um, so again, you know, what's that, what's that based on, right? That, uh, that that might uh, that might just seem unreasonably optimistic, um, and this problem I think is particularly challenging when we recall the primary motivation of pragmatism. To understand a concept, we're supposed to look at the practical difference the concept makes. To you know, we're supposed to look at what role the concept plays in inquiry. We've seen that pragmatists object to the correspondence theory because the notion of propositions matching mind-independent facts. That's just, you know, that's completely cut off from practical inquiry. We have no way to access the mind independent facts. But similarly, we have no way to access the long term future of inquiry. We have no way to establish whether any given consensus that currently prevails will continue indefinitely. I mean, the most we can say is that, OK, a given consensus has prevailed up until now. There may well be some practical point in predicting the near term future. I mean, I... You know, like, I assume that some theories are going to continue to be accepted, that society will continue to hold broadly similar values. I make predictions about what the future will look like. Yes, that's that's fine. Um, and, you know, there are many reasons for me to make predictions about what the sort of 
near term future will look like. Um, but what is supposed to be the practical payoff of any claims made about what society will look like in, you know, 200,000 years from now, right? Um, that seems as remote from us as the correspondence theorists' mind-independent facts are. Um, I mean, again, I suppose, you know, James offers a straightforward way out of this problem by just embracing relativism about truth. Uh, the truth is what is expedient in our way of thinking in the long run, but the long run might be decades rather than all of human history. Um, what's true today might not be true in 200,000 years, but so what? Uh, 200,000 years, that, that just doesn't matter to us, right? Um, okay, well, anyway, that was, uh, that was pragmatism and uh, a couple of problems with pragmatism, and um, that is the end of that. And that is uh, also the end of the uh, discussion of what we might call the, the classical theories of truth. Um, so uh, philosophical work on truth took a slightly different turn in the early 20th century with the work of somebody called Alfred Tarski. Um, prior to Tarski, there were you know, there was correspondence theory, coherence theory, pragmatism, and, and you know, that was, that was what the, the, the debate about truth sort of looked like. Uh, looked like Tarski set it off in a completely different direction. Um, we'll get to that in later videos. But I guess this, um, this kind of brings us to the, uh, yeah, the early 20th century in terms of our discussion of these different theories of truth. Um, okay, then. That is the end of that video. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.